All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. We are going to wait just a few minutes to let all of the folks who are attending today, all the students and teachers, trickle in. Um, if you are interested in having closed captioning or subtitles for this event, you can go ahead and click the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll also be putting those instructions in the chat. So if you would, again, if you would like to have subtitles for this event um, transcribed, you can go ahead and click the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Hi, everyone. Again, thank you again for, for joining us today. We're so excited to speak with you all about wildlife in the city. Um, that's one of my favorite places to see wildlife. So we're going to be um, waiting just a few more moments to let all the students enter the webinar, and then we will get started. Um, if you would like to have a transcription or, or subtitles, also known as closed captions, during this event, you can click the CC button at the bottom of your screen to enable subtitles um, so that you can uh, read along with what we're saying if you are interested in having that. Um, and also if there are any um, ASL interpreters who are um, here with students, if you could please send um, Kiana or Crystal a chat message and also raise your hand, press the raise your hand function. If you are an ASL interpreter who is here to interpret for any of the students, if you could please uh, indicate that by sending a personal message to Crystal or Kiana and um, raise your hand and we will go ahead and make you a co-host so that you can provide ASL interpretation. Um, so it looks like we have one hand raised. So we'll go ahead and um, make you a co-host so that students can see you as well. Alrighty, um, so before we get started, just one more time, if anyone is interested in having closed caption for this event or subtitles for this event, you can go ahead and click on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And if you are an ASL interpreter for any of the students, you can go ahead and press the raise your hand function and we will promote you to a co-host so that you can be seen during this webinar. Um, but without further ado, thank you all so very much for joining us for our backyard conservation program, um, focusing on using the scientific method to understand our environment. This program is co-presented um, with between Georgia Audubon and the Amphibian Foundation, both of whom are based in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Karina Newsom, and I am the Community Engagement Manager with Georgia Audubon. And Georgia Audubon is a wildlife conservation organization dedicated to building places where birds and people thrive 
through conservation, education, and community engagement. Um, and so I'm gonna pass it over to Kiana to introduce herself and then end with Crystal before we get started. Thanks, Karina. My name is Kiana Leverett. I am the Education Program Coordinator with Georgia Audubon, and I'm so excited for all of you guys to be joining us today. Hi, everyone. My name is Crystal Mandika, and I am the Director of Education at the Amphibian Foundation. Alrighty. Well, we're going to go ahead and jump right in. Um, to talking about the scientific method, and Kiana is going to kick us off. Awesome. So today is all about the scientific method, and what exactly is that? So the scientific method is something that all of us use every single day, and it is an approach to problem solving that has multiple steps and is widely used across disciplines, and so I'm going to break down those steps for you guys. So the first step is to make an observation. So look out into the world around you and notice something, it could be anything. And after you make an observation, the next thing that you want to do is to ask a question. So think about a question that can be a who, what, where, when, or why. And using that question, you wanna formulate a hypothesis and a hypothesis is an educated guess, which would be the answer to your question. So you have an idea of a who, what, where, when, or why, and then your hypothesis, or your educated guess, is what you think the answer is. And once you have what you think the answer is, you're going to make a prediction on how things are going to turn out with by asking your question. And once you have an idea of what you want your prediction to be, you can create a model or a method to test your prediction, this is part of the experiment, the experiment part of the scientific method. And once you test your prediction, you can either come to a conclusion or you can use your results to form a new hypothesis, a new educated guess. That's right. So um, today we are going to walk through an example of moving through the scientific method by using the world around us right here in Atlanta, Georgia, as an, uh, as an example. Um, so one of the things that myself and Crystal and Kiana observe about the world around us is that we are in, of course, a really metropolitan or urban area. Um, and with urban area comes a lot of built environment or man-made structures. And that especially includes roads. And roads are used by people on foot, people in cars, people on bikes all kinds of transportation. In addition to having lots of roads moving through our city, we also have wildlife that lives among us in these urban environments. So these two realities are something that us as people who love wildlife and pay attention to wildlife notice. And so that is our observation. After making an observation like that, that we have both roads and wildlife uh, living right here or existing right here in the middle of the city of Atlanta, we form a question based on that observation. So the question we thought of was, do roads impact biodiversity? And biodiversity simply refers to the number of species in a given area. Um, so if an area has high biodiversity, there are a lot of different species. If there is low biodiversity, there's only a few species. So we wanted to know, since we have roads and wildlife in the same locations, do roads impact biodiversity? And so in order to form an, a hypothesis based on our question, as Kiana mentioned before, we need to do a little bit of research about our question, right? So if I wanna know if roads impact biodiversity, I wanna look up what some of the impacts of roads are, right? What do roads do to the world around them? Um, and unfortunately, roads have a lot of negative impacts on the places where they exist. And some of those impacts include the following. Um, when cars are driving on a road, whether it's a highway or maybe a city street or a neighborhood area, there is a lot of runoff that happens. Runoff is essentially when the chemicals that tend to leak out of cars, whether um, we're talking about different fluids or, or oil, um, kind of in the picture represented here on the right-hand side, and it rains, right, that all those chemicals and all those oils get flushed into our water systems, they get into the surrounding um, grass, into the surrounding plant life and the soil. 
And so that runoff, the chemicals from the cars, gets into the natural environment around us. Another impact of roads is something called noise pollution. Usually when we think of pollution, we're thinking of chemicals, but noise can also be a form of pollution. The reason why that's the case is because where there is a lot of noise, a lot of sound happening, um, where wildlife are living, that can disrupt wildlife behavior, right? So some animals depend heavily on their sense of hearing to hide from predators, right? To know when there's a predator around and take cover. Some animals are predators and depend on hearing to find their prey, like owls, for example, right? Um, and some animals depend on hearing to find mates, for example, right? So think of songbirds that are singing in the springtime. If there's a lot of noise from cars on the roads, those signals are getting interrupted and they're not able to detect what's going on around them the way they would if it were quieter. So that's what noise pollution is. And then you also have air pollution. If you're someone who lives near a busy, a busy road or have been on a busy road, you might be used to seeing, for example, large trucks that are bursting plumes of pollution into the air that you can actually see with your eyes. And sometimes it's a little less noticeable, like from the, the cars that are daily drivers on the road. So that air pollution, of course, interacts directly with anything and anyone living around those roads. So now that I have this information about roads and the impacts that they have on the world around them, I'm gonna make a hypothesis, um, an educated guess about what roads are doing to biodiversity specifically. So I want to see what you all think. What do you think our hypothesis should be? And Kiana is gonna put a poll up for you to um, put in your, your best guess. So what do you think? We hypothesize that biodiversity goes up or down close to roads, okay? So given what we have heard about the impact of roads on the surrounding environment, do you hypothesize that biodiversity, remember number of species in an area, goes up or down closer to roads? So we've got some answers trickling in. Awesome, we've got a couple of uh, ups. We have um, many downs and it's looking like um, and all this is anonymous, so you can go ahead and put your vote in. We don't know who's voting, but we want to see what everyone thinks. Um, based on the research that we saw about the impact of roads, the most likely correct, so to speak, hypothesis would be that biodiversity probably goes down close to roads, right? If you're thinking about noise pollution and you're thinking about runoff. Um, and so it looks like most people selected down. And we're gonna go with that. It looks like the, 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 the votes are with down. Um, so we're going to go with that hypothesis. Thank you all so much for voting. All righty. Um, and so our hypothesis we decided is that biodiversity goes down close to roads. Now, to help us think about this and, and bring this into our real life, there are lots of different parks in the city of Atlanta, but we chose two that are um, in the Buckhead kind of metro Atlanta area, um, Chastain Park and Blue Heron Nature Preserve. One park, Chastain Park, is about 645 feet from the nearest main road, while Blue Heron Nature Preserve is about 135 feet from the nearest road. So given our hypothesis, that biodiversity or number of species goes down closer to roads, what would your prediction be about which of these locations has more biodiversity? So Kiana is gonna put another poll in the chat for a prediction. What do you think? Chastain Park, remember the one further from the road, Chastain Park will have more or fewer species than Blue Heron Nature Preserve, which is closer to a road. So go ahead and put your, um, your prediction in. Do you think that Chastain Park, which is further from a road, will have more species or fewer species compared to Blue Heron Nature Preserve? What do you think? So we've got votes coming in. Uh, we've got a couple votes for fewer. We've got a, a, a several votes for, for more. All right. So again, thinking about our hypothesis that we have fewer species closer to roads, which of these places will have um, more species? Do you think Chastain Park will have more or fewer species than Blue Heron Nature Preserve? So it looks like most people voted for more 
Um, and that does align with our hypothesis. So we're going to go with that prediction. It looks like most people in the chat um, have voted for Chastain Park having more species than Blue Heron Nature Preserve. Um, and so that will be the prediction that we make going into um, testing our hypothesis, okay? Now, when it comes to testing our hypothesis, to do that, we need to measure biodiversity, right? We need to be able to measure biodiversity at both Chastain Park and Blue Heron Nature Preserve to see if what we expect to happen actually takes place. Um, and so with that, um, Crystal and Kiana are going to talk a little bit about the different ways to measure biodiversity, specifically focusing on birds and amphibians, because those are the, the, the wildlife that we really specialize in. So we're going to focus on them for this, uh, for this session. Um, so we'll start with Crystal talking about the ways that you can survey biodiversity when it comes to amphibians. Thanks so much, Karina. So yes, let's talk about finding amphibians. So first we have to identify what amphibians are. And so they are a group of animals that have very moist skin, they breathe through their skin, um, and you'll find that they have two lives and they tend to metamorphose in order to get to their second life. And so there are three groups of animals that fall into the amphibian category. We have frogs and toads, salamanders and newts, and Sicilians. So Sicilians you won't really find very often because they're the most secretive of all of the amphibian species. And so you might find Sicilians in the water or you might find them underground because they are the most secretive. But when you're outside, most likely looking for amphibians, what you're looking for is going to be frogs and toads and salamanders and newts. And so let's talk about the ways that you can find these animals. So the first way is an auditory survey, and that is just using your ears, just listening. And so uh, when you're listening for amphibians, you're actually only going to be listening for frogs and toads because they're the only amphibian that actually make any call. And another fun fact about calling frogs and toads is that you'll only normally hear adult males calling. And so sometimes you might hear a female that makes a noise that says, hey, leave me alone. I don't feel like talking to you right now. But for the most part, it's the male frogs and toads that you hear calling. And so if you're out listening at night, if you're hearing calls, those are going to be adult males. Next, we have visual surveys and visual surveys using transects. So a visual survey is just using your eyes, just trying to figure out what you can see as you're walking through a path. And so a transect is just that, it's a path that you create. And so what you do, you create a path based on where you think a good place to find amphibians might be. And so what you would wanna do is to standardize all of the things that you're going to do. And to standardize, that means just to make it the same. So you're going to make it the same, the length of the transect that you're going to look at. So if you look at the diagram here on the right, you can see the spot where there are arrows pointing upward. And you can see that those will be the transects or the paths that you would look to find your amphibians. And so you would definitely want to always make your path the same in order to make sure you're collecting the very um, verifiable same data. You'll also want to make sure that you're going out at the same time of day to survey. So uh, into the early evening to dark is the best time to go out and look for, uh, for amphibians. And so you will also want to keep it the same with the time amount that you've spent looking for the amphibians. So if you take a time, let's say six o'clock in the evening that you go out looking and you look from six o'clock to seven o'clock, that is your standardized time. And that's when you know that you're going to be looking for amphibians. And next, when you're doing terrestrial surveys, there are a few different tools that you can use. Uh, sometimes we use traps to find amphibians. One of the traps is called a funnel trap. And funnel traps are good for both terrestrial or land surveys and aquatic 
for water surveys. And so what you would do, you just place your funnel trap just in a spot and then amphibians will then funnel right into your trap. And then you can see what biodiversity you have in that area. Another trap that's really wonderful for detecting amphibians is a pitfall trap. And a pitfall trap is a really amazing type of trap where you actually dig out a hole. And it's on the bottom uh, diagram that you can see in the pictures below. And so you dig out a little trench and you place your pitfall trap in there. And then your amphibians will walk and they'll actually fall into the pit trap. And then you'll, you'll be able to find what biodiversity you have in that area. So if you look at that top right picture on your screen, you'll see that we have found in, in these traps, we found spotted salamanders and we found a wood frog. So that is amazing and something that you could definitely find if you were able to use traps. And if you weren't using traps, you might not find those species. Next, we have aquatic surveys, which is um, just water surveys. So you can use funnel traps, like I said, to uh, have your your amphibians go into the funnel traps and you basically just pick a spot, your favorite spot that looks like a good place to find amphibians and use a random point generator to just figure out the best spot to put your funnel trap. The dip net surveys are bolded because that is a technique that we used most recently when we went out looking for amphibians. And if you look at the top right picture, you can see our surveyors holding their dip nets and those are just wonderful big nets that'll be able to find lots of different amphibians. And then we also have visual transect surveys for aquatic surveys. And so you would look for eggs, like in that second picture that you see right in the middle, those are amphibian eggs, or it could be larvae that you're finding. And so you might find larval salamanders that still have gills because they're breathing in water. Or you might find aquatic adults, which are so amazing to find. Awesome. So when you are sharing biodiversity or looking for biodiversity with birds, there are a couple of different ways that you can do it. The first one, which is mainly used by scientists, is banding. And banding involves actually physically catching a bird in what is known as a mist net, which was the method that we used for our experiment. Another method that is used on particularly larger birds is GPS tracking because it allows scientists from a distance to be able to tell how far and where a bird is traveling to. There also, for an even, on an even larger scale, are radar images because from satellites, we're able to pick up heat signatures and see large amounts of not a specific bird, but just groups of animals in movement along a given area. So those are the three main ways that we use it, but the more traditional way to measure biodiversity is bird watching, is birding, is going out and seeing what is around you. So here we have a heat map of migration that shows just where a particular species, particularly the wood thrush, is traveling in a given year. And this survey was taken through eBird, which is an app that a lot of people like to use, that whether you realize it or not, it is just counting birds and putting in checklists, but that same data is sent to scientists and then scientists are able to use that data to measure biodiversity all over the world. So as you can see, because of that data, we're able to really pinpoint where this particular bird is being seen and where it's traveling to, and you can tell by the white. And so that this entire graphic was an entire year of it migrating, which we were able to do through birding. All right, so we, now that you know a little bit about how we can measure biodiversity, specifically focusing on amphibians and birds, we're gonna show you how we did it in the field at the two Atlanta parks that we mentioned. So let's go take a look. Here we go. So we are going to start flipping logs to look for salamanders. So you want to find a place that's got some moisture around it 
and it's luckily just rained. So we're gonna check right here under this sweet little log and see if we can find a salamander. Oops, nobody under here. And so it's always really important when you're checking for salamanders or other uh, reptiles or amphibians that you always put nature back the way that you found it. So I'm going to go ahead and put all of these, the sleep litter back where I found it and the log here. That way it's a suitable habitat for an amphibian or reptile to come later on. Keep looking. All right, here we are at another wet log. Let's see if we have any luck. We do have luck. Everybody, come look, get a closer look. Here we have a red back salamander, and this is native to Metro Atlanta, native to Georgia, and it's just a beautiful specimen. You can see it's got that long tail, and it's called a red back because it has that beautiful red coloring right down its back. And these are just small little guys. These guys will get just a little bit bigger, maybe about five inches long. So exciting. And so he is all alone under here. And so what we're gonna do, I'm gonna show you the proper way of returning an animal back to its habitat. So what we're gonna do is put the log back the way that we found it, just right here. And then once the log is back where it was, then that's when you release your amphibian back to its habitat. And there he goes. All right, here we are at another log. Let's flip this one and see if we have any luck. Oh, yes. Oh, come here, come here. Come here, let's go. Here he is. And here we have another red back salamander. So you can see there is slight variation in these salamanders. This one is a little bit smaller than the last one we found, but you still see that red streak going down the back, which gives it its name. And these are beautiful little guys. Can you see his little face? Look at him. Awesome. So we're gonna do that same thing again. Replace our log just the way that we found it. And then release our little friend back to his home. There he goes. Hi. So one of the really cool things that you can do when you're looking for amphibians is dip netting. So this is a dip net. It's a regular old net and it's got holes of course so that the water will go through but it will leave us with whatever is living inside. So let's take a look and see what we find. Nobody yet. able to physically find and hold um, salamander species at Chastain Park. And even though we didn't catch any birds in our mist net that Kiana described a few moments ago, we still were able to capture a measure of the biodiversity by using our ears and using our eyes to see and hear how many different species we had at Chastain Park. Um, now we're going to move over to Blue Heron Nature Preserve, the area that was closer to Rose, to see what we find there. Thank you. 
dang. Okay. Very stoic there, you almost not smile there. Alright, so depending on what bird you catch, um, they each have their own unique um, fan size, just like humans have you know bigger wrists or smaller wrists or you know bigger legs or small legs. Uh, birds are the same way depending on whether it's a small bird like a Carolina wren or a medium bird like maybe an American robin or something huge like a heron or an egret or an eagle even. Um, so it's important to know that you're putting on the right size bracelet for each bird. And we know for this bird this is the right size. And hopefully you can pick this up. But there's very, very, very small numbers on there. And there are nine numbers. And so again, depending on uh, the exact band you have, that nine number code is special and only found on this bird. So again, if we were to catch it again, or if it were to be found by another researcher, or if unfortunately it got caught in the house, for example, and someone caught it, we could learn about the bird by tracing this nine digit number. And so we have these special pliers, which you can see have the kind of that little peg at the top. And what you do is you put the band on that and you can open it up and the band is made of aluminum. So it's strong, but not that strong. And it creates a little opening here. Then once it's open, you plop it in the right part here at the end. And that way you can see how it's open. And what that allows us to do is just safely and gently hold the bird's leg, slide it right in. You can see that, Karina? And then gently clamp it down and undo the plier. And voila, this bird now has that bracelet that'll be on it almost certainly as long as the bird lives. And so that bird is now banded, is the term we use in the ornithological community. You can see it, it smoothly slides up and down, but it doesn't go over their wrist or down past their joints. So that's how we know it's the right size. And so depending on the project and what you're trying to look for, there's a whole slew of data that you can, you can collect. For this project and what we're doing here in Atlanta, um, we're just collecting some very minimal data. Uh, mainly the age and the sex if we can, um, as well as documenting the number on that band again so we can keep track of this bird should it ever be caught. And as, again, depending on the project and what your questions are, which is really important when you're thinking about the scientific method and your scientific research, there's a lot you can do. You can look at how healthy they are. Do they have a lot of fat on their body? Are they in good shape? Um, are they changing their feathers, which birds do once or twice a year? Um, there's a lot of exciting things you can do once you have the bird in the hand. This is kind of a tricky thing to do. Another thing which we're not going to do today, but I will show you. Um, let me see if I can open it. Here we go. The one problem about this metal band I showed you with these nine numbers, they're really small. You can't see them with binoculars. You can only read those numbers if the bird is caught again. Um, but maybe you want to know who that individual is and what he or she is doing when they're out in the woods. And so some researchers, including myself, depending on the project, we'll put a series of color bands in addition to the metal band. So sometimes, let's say this bird, I could put three oranges. And so we might call them oof, O-O-O-F. Or you could put green, pink, red in the metal band. And that way, when you're out and about just using binoculars, you can go, oh, there's that Carolina Wren with three oranges. I know him from that time we caught him when we were shooting the video. Or, oh, O-O-O, you know, is paired with G-G-R for green, green, red. So you can do really interesting behavioral monitoring um, by using color bands. Again, we're not going to do that today, but it's a very similar process. There's something called a shoehorn, like this, and you can just plop off a color. So actually, you know what? We can throw a blue on this one just, just for fun. So they have a little crease in them. You just slide the shoehorn in and it spreads open the plastic. You then put it over the bird's leg and just slide it right off. And so now this bird has the metal band and it has the blue one. And again, depending on what colors you use and what combinations, you can have like a, like a name tag almost. Um, so you know what bird you're looking at if you're out in the woods. All right, so here's our Carolina Wren. 
So we're gonna go ahead and let him go right here. Woo. Nice! And there he goes. Yay! <laughs> All right, um, so that is how we collected biodiversity or number of species data um, at both Chastain Park and Blue Heron Nature Preserve. And now it's time to look at the results. What did the biodiversity look like between these two parks, given the fact that they were both different distances from the nearest main roads? Um, so first, Chastain Park, which was farthest from the road, had a total of 26 bird species, which again, we identified by sight and sound, and one amphibian species that was found twice, the redback salamander. And these are just a few of the species that we found at Chastain Park. Uh, the first is the red-shouldered hawk that you see with all the striping, which is a very cool bird of prey that's found right here in the city of Atlanta, um, very beautiful bird. Um, we also heard and saw eastern towhees, which is the picture in the center there, um, which is a kind of sparrow actually. And then finally the red-backed salamander that uh, Crystal was talking about just a moment ago. Now moving over to Blue Heron Nature Preserve, which was much closer to the nearest main road, um, 135 feet, there were only seven bird species that we detected and no amphibians. Um, and one thing that I wanna point out is that zero amphibians does not mean that there was no data. Zero is actually data when you're looking at biodiversity because it tells us that there are no species in this area, which points to the fact that they have either preference for one location over the other, or there's something about a particular area that makes it hard or impossible for them to survive there. So those zeros, even though as a biologist and someone going out and looking for the animals can feel disappointing because it's really cool and fun to find wildlife, right? It's still important information to have when we know that there is nothing in a particular area, um, in this case, amphibians. And so just a couple of the highlight bird species that we saw at Blue Heron Nature Preserve include the tufted titmouse, which is the first directly under um, Blue Heron Nature Preserve section here, which is a small gray bird with a beautiful tuft. Um, in the center there, we have the Carolina chickadee with the black cap and the black throat. And finally, the belted kingfisher, which is actually a very cool species that uh, hunts fish primarily. They're very good at diving and catching fish and other um, food under the water, aquatic prey, um, prey that lives in the water. So those are just a couple of the species that we saw at Blue Heron Nature Preserve. Now, given these results, given how we've seen that Chastain Park, which is further from roads, has more species overall than Blue Heron Nature Preserve, which is closer to the road, was our hypothesis supported? So Kiana's gonna put um, an, another poll in the, um, in front of you all. And remember, our hypothesis was that biodiversity or number of roads goes, or excuse me, biodiversity or number of species goes down when you're closer to roads, right? And so our results showed us that Chastain Park, which was further from the roads, had more species of birds and amphibians. So was our hypothesis supported? Um, and so as the, um, uh, Answers are rolling in. So far, we have yeses only. Um, folks saying that yes, our hypothesis that near roads you have fewer species is supported. All right. Looks like we still got 100% on the yes. Um, and incredible. I think that both myself and Kiana and Crystal would all agree with you that our hypothesis was, in fact, supported. Um, just as you all have agreed with us as well. And so given the fact that our hypothesis was supported and given the data that you saw, what are your, some of your thoughts? What do our results tell us about life in the city for wildlife, about roads specifically? Um, I wanna give you a second to write into the chat. Um, what do the results tell us about the life of wildlife in the city, about the impacts of roads um, on wildlife. Go ahead and give yourself a second to think about that. And then go ahead and plug into the chat um, what comes to your mind about what these results are telling us. So I'll give you a second to think about that. And then um, Kiana, if you don't mind, if folks uh, have any ideas or Crystal, if folks have any ideas that they are putting into the chat, feel free to, um, to let us know and share that with us. You know, when you collect this data, Collecting data is really important because it allows you to see patterns, right? 
it allows for patterns to emerge. And so in this case, we saw right a very clear um, difference in the number or abundance of wildlife species in one place compared to another. Um, and so that is an important pattern to know. Um, so as you're thinking about the, the results that we have, if you have any thoughts or ideas that come to your mind or even questions, you can absolutely feel free to share those um, in the chat. So we do have a response in the chat. Someone said, the road can have an adverse effect in the wildlife that is surrounding it. We also have some other ones. Even though it might be a preserve, if it is closer to a road, you are likely to experience fewer species than a park. Luna Calandra said, roads are more dangerous and inhospitable to wildlife. And we have another response saying, we need to take this into account when building roads. Mm. Less air pollution, less cars on the road for less sound. Those are all really good thoughts, really good points. And it's interesting, right? Of the two parks, the nature preserve was the one that was closer to the road and therefore had fewer detectable species according to the little study that we carried out um, in the city of Atlanta. And so just because something is a protected area or a nature preserve, what's going on immediately around that, right, actually impacts the species that can live within it. So that is a really great observation and something that's really important to think about when you are a scientist that works with wildlife or you're someone who makes decisions about wildlife conservation. Um, so those are all really good observations and thoughts about what this data reveals to us about the life of wildlife in the city. We have another question from Kat and Turner saying, why didn't the preserve build farther away from the road? It's a good question. <laughs> That is a really good question. And you know, um, I, I couldn't necessarily give you an answer for why. Um, sometimes in the city, it is tough to find land to protect. And oftentimes when you're in the middle and surrounded by roads, there is actually value in creating these little pockets of green space for wildlife. Um, even though it may be less appealing or less hospitable compared to ones that are further away from roads, um, we always, we do actually encourage folks to create, no matter how big or small or how urban or rural, um, to create as many pockets of natural space for wildlife, because even though it may not be as used as other pockets, it still gets used and it actually does benefit wildlife. So um, that would be my answer. Of course, there are probably a lot more factors to go into why they put it particularly at that location, but um, that's, that's part of it as well. Great question. Um, so, now what we're going to do is um, introduce you to some of the Atlanta amphibian and bird species that we have living right in the city of Atlanta, right here in Georgia. Um, and we're gonna start with our amphibians and Crystal's gonna tell you a little bit about the diversity of amphibians that we have here, as well as some of the threats that are related to roads that they are facing. So some of our favorite Atlanta amphibians are salamanders. And just like the ones that we found when we were out doing our surveys, we have the southern redback salamander. And so this kind of gives you a nice, clear, close-up picture of what that redback salamander looks like. And you can see the red coloration down its back, which gives it its name. And the southern redback salamander is found in mixed forest habitats. And these are actually terrestrial breeders, which means that they don't necessarily need water in order to lay their eggs, uh, which is a really amazing adaptation. One of the places that you can find the redback salamander is the Fernbank Forest, a really popular uh, Fernbank Forest preserve that you can go to. It's a museum and they've got lots of open, lovely space. Another wonderful Atlanta amphibian is the slimy salamander. And as you might guess from its name, the salamander actually oozes out slime from its body whenever it feels threatened. So if you have 
a predator that is going for it, trying to bite the slimy salamander, what it'll do, it will ooze slime all over the mouth of the predator and hopefully get a chance to escape and kind of jump out of the mouth of its predator. Um, and so actually, if you were to pick up a slimy salamander, it would ooze slime all over your hand too. So you would feel that stickiness and tackiness. Um, these guys are also terrestrial breeders, which means that they don't need water in order to lay their eggs. And two popular parks where you can find the slimy salamander is Wynn Park and Murphy Candler Park, two great parks here in Atlanta. And if you're looking for frog and toad species, one of the most common toads that we have in Atlanta is the American toad. And so if you look at that top right picture of this toad, you can see that it's got really bumpy skin. So as we know, toads have bumpier skin, um, wartier skin than frogs do. Frogs typically have smooth, wet skin, and toads typically have dry and bumpy skin. And now this amphibian is very common to the metro Atlanta area, and it's actually found in drier upland mixed forests and granite outcrops, which I find absolutely amazing. So this second picture that you'll see here, it's uh, one of the mountains, Panola or Arabia Mountain, I believe it's Arabia Mountain. And that is one of the granite outcrops where you would find this American toad. So just another wonderful species for you to find when you're out and about in Metro Atlanta. And one thing that we have to consider when we're talking about amphibians and our, uh, our habitat that we live in, we live in Metro Atlanta, so it's full of roads and buildings. And so amphibians have to deal with traffic and cars. So you'll have two areas where a salamander will be spending its time during the year. The first area is its upland area where it spends 50 out of 52 weeks of the year. And that's where it's doing its salamander thing. But then two weeks of the year, it travels down to its breeding ground. And if that breeding ground happens to be in between, or, or if, if there happens to be a road built in between its upland area and its breeding area, that amphibian has to cross a road in order to get to its breeding ground. So as you can see in that top right picture, this poor little spotted salamander has to deal with cars on the road. And so we hope that amphibians are able to travel across the road safely, but many times it's not the case. And also, amphibians have to deal with litter and pollution. So litter where people are throwing uh, trash out of their cars as they're driving by or as people are walking by just throwing garbage on the streets. These amphibians have to deal with with pollution and litter and it makes it really difficult for them to live their amphibian lives. So Atlanta is known as a city in the trees and birds, most birds live in trees. So a lot of the time you'll see issues with birds and when it comes to roads, when there are lots of lots of trees around, there are over 400 native species that are in and about Atlanta and 250 in Georgia, I mean, and 250 of them can be found here in Atlanta. The ruby-throated hummingbird pictured in this picture is a migratory species that is native to that is native to Atlanta, but it is the number one bird that is found in most collisions. So when people find a dead bird, the one that is found the most happens to be the ruby-throated hummingbird, this small little bird. But and so it's very susceptible. But other birds are backyard birds, which are birds that are here all year round, are also susceptible to to roads. And normally when, you drive, when you're driving down the road and you see something that's dead on the side of the road, it can provide a resource for certain kinds of birds, like birds of prey, like, like vultures, turkey vultures and black vultures. It creates a buffet for them. But on the flip side, it can pose a lot of other challenges. Here we have pictured the American robin, the cardinal, 
the crow, the eastern bluebird, and the house finch. And all of these birds are birds that, again, they nest in trees. And so when it comes time for them to actually build a nest and start a family, they can put their nest near a road. And that can pose problems as far as noise. That can make them susceptible to predators that are able to see them from the road. And birds tend to use whatever is around them in order to build their nests. So instead of using natural materials like wood, twigs, mud, things that you can find on a forest floor, they might, like Crystal said, take litter, like empty chip bags or plastic or, or string and use that to build it into its nest. So it, there is a lot of danger for birds in and about near roads. And, but I would say the main issue for them is collisions, collisions with cars. So thinking about what we've learned uh, when it comes to our data collection, when it comes to what we found in the research about the impacts of roads and what we know about the specific threats facing the native species that we have in Atlanta and in Georgia more widely, we're going to head over to hear from um, a wildlife expert that is uh, doing a fellowship with Georgia Audubon on the coast to talk about how the scientific method plays out in real life in wildlife conservation research. So I'm going to turn it over to Sergio Sabat Bonilla. Hi everyone. Hopefully you still have enough energy to continue. And here I'll be talking to you about conservation, how it relates to the scientific method, and what are some of the ways we're utilizing this information uh, to better protect uh, the key habitats and environments along the Georgia coast. More specifically in my regards, I'm focusing on shorebirds, which are these very cute small birds that you see along the beach. Uh, but a little bit more background uh, information about me. My name is Sergio Sabat. Uh, I'm the Georgia Sea Grant. Uh, I'm working here at Jekyll Island. Uh, I spend most of my time looking at birds, specifically at the beach. As you see here, I can't complain. Definitely have a very, very good uh, office view. Uh, in my day to day, I go along the beach uh, pretty much looking at uh, what birds are there. Most of these are migratory birds, but you start seeing a lot of uh, these bigger birds like the brown pelicans, uh, white pelicans. We have uh, royal terns, Caspian terns. We have a good amount of congregation along the southern portion of Jekyll Island, which makes it a key conservation site. And then from here, you might ask, how does the conservation relate to the scientific method? Well, utilizing that information, that peer reviewed data uh, from the scientific method, we're able to create these conservation programs to better target key habitats, key species uh, that are most prone for environmental uh, impact or human impact in that regards. And that's how uh, we are able to decide. Uh, so the scientific method plays a vital role. And then from there, uh, we pretty much you continue to utilize each of the steps as we not only impose, but also perfect that uh, conservation plan. The reason why we it's important to conserve, uh, provide conservation, is because of these uh, environmental impacts uh, and human induced impact, like you see in this uh, boat uh, getting stuck in front of the northern portion of the shoreline at Jekyll Island. Uh, it's creating huge environmental uh, disaster uh, that might be impacting negatively uh, shorebirds and their nesting, uh, feeding, and key habitats because Georgia sits right in the mid middle of the Georgia Bight, uh, which is visited by 300,000 shorebirds annually, has this unique uh, mixture of very, very high tide and very, very low tides, uh, which pretty much uh, allows for uh, a huge area of potential food resources that are exposed by these receding tides uh, and pretty much supports uh, these huge congregation of, of shorebirds along either the migratory routes uh, for north or south. Uh, some of these uh, shorebirds that we expect are red knots uh, that pretty much travel all the way down from South America, the pretty much the most southern uh, point, all the way up north to the, one of the most northern points of North America. And it utilizes Georgia as its resting stop through these huge migrations. Another example is a piping plover. And as you see here, this one is named Esperanza. Esperanza meaning hope in Spanish. Uh, it's part of the Midwest tribe uh, of these uh, piping plovers. And it's uh, seen uh, by that red band on that right feet. Uh, 
this bird pretty much is first seen uh, last year uh, from its nest up in downtown Chicago. Uh, and then this year was popular migration uh, here and along the Georgia coast. So these are very, very important habitats, again, that need to be conserved. Uh, and through the scientific method, we're able to obtain the information required to not only know what habitats are important, but also how to maintain them uh, and how to obtain key information from these birds. Here you see a good example of how data is being collected within these conservation groups. Here is the DNR uh, capturing these oyster cachers, uh, not only to be able to count and uh, age uh, the population within these uh, uh, islands, but uh, length measurements of their wings, uh, pretty much coloration, uh, being noted and I'll put bands on them so that they can track their movements throughout the span of time. Uh, these are Wilson plovers uh, eggs being floated to, to have an estimate of the age range of these uh, eggs so that we know when they're when they were placed and where they're gonna hatch that way we are able to do the same uh, bit of information gathering uh, before they're able to have enough energy and uh, supply to venture off into their migration patterns. Hope you guys enjoyed it and have a little more knowledge next time you go to the beach. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Sergio, for that cool look at some conservation uh, and science, uh, scientific method in action on our own coast here in Georgia. Um, and so in conclusion, the scientific method might sound like a really technical method for problem solving, but believe it or not, it actually follows our normal thought process for making observations and asking questions about what we see. Whether we're talking about our day-to-day -day life with our friends, right? You might notice a friend acting differently. That's an observation. You might then try to figure out what's wrong, right? That's you testing a hypothesis about um, you know, what the problem might be. Um, and then using that information to come to a solution or come to a conclusion about what the problem is, right? So we use this pattern of problem solving even in our everyday lives, um, but we also use it, of course, as we've said this whole time in science. So whether you are um, interacting with people in your friend group or your family, or you're a biologist out in the wilderness or out, or out on the coast studying things like bears or birds or amphibians, um, the scientific method is a really wonderful way to ask questions um, and, and see patterns in the world around you and understand just how humans are impacting the world that we share with wildlife. Um, and so with that, um, I will go ahead and if there are any questions that have come up um, or that you have for myself or Kiana or Crystal, we would love to answer them for you. Um, we will all also, if it's okay, put our emails in the chat. So if you are a teacher who's here today or even a student and you have questions about what it looks like to have a career even in wildlife sciences. I'm a, a bird scientist, so is Kiana and Crystal specializes in amphibians and reptiles. Um, so we love to share our experience and our knowledge and the, the cool things that we've been able to witness and encounter as scientists and as educators, and we love sharing that with others. Um, so as I said, we will all put our email into the chat and you can absolutely feel free to reach out to any of us with questions um, or interests about uh, what we talked about today or anything else that has come to your mind. Um, and so with that, again, if you have any questions, you can put it into the chat or into the Q&A. Um, but if not, we thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon and hopefully you were able to learn something cool about the world around you and think of new ways to make observations and to come to conclusions about what's happening, whether you're in the city or you're in a rural area. Um, there's always something to notice, always questions to ask, and so much to discover when you look at the world around you. Um, and so with that, we thank you all so much for coming and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much for coming, everyone.